Thank you for joining us today for session one in our Animal Behavioral Neuroscience webinar series. My name is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Today's session is titled Circadian Rhythms of Food Intake, Are You Seeing the Whole Picture? and is focused on understanding the link between metabolism and animal behavior. We are joined by Dr. John Lighton, President and Chief Scientist at Sable Systems International, who is one of the world's leading experts on the subject of respirometry and associated techniques for making metabolic measurements in laboratory research applications. He has published over 80 scientific papers in this field and has been behind the design and manufacturing of research instrumentation for over 30 years that today can be found in research labs all around the world. In addition to a review of essential physiology concepts, Dr. Lighton is going to discuss some of the caveats related to the tools and methods that researchers must be aware of to successfully capture metabolic and behavior data simultaneously, arming them with the data required for more complex research applications and successful publication in peer-reviewed journals. Well, welcome everyone. Um, very glad that you're here. And I'm going to be giving a fairly wide-ranging talk and it's going to be fairly fast-moving. And hopefully you'll come up with some questions and as Andy mentioned, I'll be sticking around for some time after the talk is finished and I'll be very happy to address the questions then as well. So to get started, um, we, everyone over here has a particular aim in terms of research and you're, everyone you know, has an individual aim, but what we're going to be doing in this talk is looking at the ways in which you can obtain data that are relevant to the research aims that you have. So for example, <clears throat> We have uh, you know, intake um, and output. You have food and water intake. You have metabolic heat and activity in terms of output. You need to have the data synchronized in order to make meaningful, meaningful correlations between them. And this again means that because the signals can shift very rapidly, you need to have high temporal resolution. And because sometimes the data themselves can be fairly subtle, you can be dealing with small changes, um, you need reasonably high data resolution as well. In order to make sense of all of the information that you're collecting, you need the maximum amount of analytical flexibility. And when I say the more data modalities, the better. What I mean is <clears throat> you need the maximum number of variables being sensed simultaneously and in a synchronized way from the animal so that you can obtain the maximum possible amount of information from them. So let's have a look at the proximate ends that you can use to achieve your ultimate goals. And I'm going to be actually mentioning some interesting findings that we have made and um, I've made in conjunction with some of the um, collaborations that I've engaged with with some academic researchers as well. Now, everything really in the system that we'll be describing revolves around the cage. This is a picture of the cage. We'll be seeing similar pictures fairly frequently in the talk. And ultimately, when you're dealing with the cage that houses your experimental animal, this particular wet cage is a mouse cage. We have cages for rats. Uh, we, have, we can also do larger animals as well. In fact, the largest animal that we have dealt with is a killer whale, literally. And the smallest that we've dealt with is uh, C. elegans and uh, Drosophila. But anyway, returning to mice and rats, so the ideal here is to have a home cage, which means that the animal is relatively accustomed to being in it. It doesn't have any strange and alien features. It's at ambient temperature, ambient relative humidity. It is not sealed. And also the cage needs to have the ability, if necessary, to be compatible with metabolic measurement. Now, throughout the talk, I'll be mentioning quite a lot about metabolic measurement. But none of the food intake and behavior items that I'm talking about are dependent on the presence of metabolic measurement. Metabolic measurement simply gives you some additional information that is really interesting. So looking in more detail at the cage, you can see here we have mass measurement modules up on the lid. And I'll be coming to those in more detail later. We have a water container. A stainless steel shroud is removed here so you can see it. Food hopper. Uh, XYZ free field array, so we know the position of the mouse at all times. Uh, access control for the food hopper. Uh, running wheel built into the cage. 
And this curious thing here at the bottom is a respirometry manifold, and I'll be coming to that in a bit more detail in a moment. Now, looking at mass monitoring, there are various ways in which you can go about monitoring the mass of things like, for example, food hoppers, water hoppers, habitats, etc. The cheapest and easiest is to use uh, what's called a, an isometric force transducer. They're okay for student labs, but if you really need accuracy and resolution, you need to go to a different kind of instrumentation, which is called the load cell. And the load cell is at the heart of lab balances, all of the commercially available lab balances by Sartorius, Metler, and all of the rest use load cells, and they give outstanding resolution, linearity, and range, but they are difficult to use. And we're very proud of the mass monitors that we have produced. Um, they are very compact and retain individual calibration, which is an important feature for mass monitors because each of them has its own individual calibration and having that built in is very useful. So let's look at food intake. Um, so this uses the mass monitor using a fuel cell, sorry, using a load cell, um, real-time measurement, and we're recording all of the information, or the uh, good system should be able to record all of the information to disk um, at a reasonably high frequency. We record everything from the entire system at one hertz. And the resolution in terms of mass is about 2 milligrams, so 0 0.002 grams resolution over a 1 kilogram range. The food hopper has a crumb tray, so there's no spillage involved with it. And we have variable grill spacings, which are an important thing to have for different kinds of diets, such as high-fat diet and conventional chow, etc. So we can reduce caching to, to the extent that is possible. Um, and so the, the grills are actually interchangeable. So let's look at some actual raw data from the food intake sensors. What you're looking at over here is four individual feeding episodes, and you're looking in particular at the mass of the hopper. So we're looking at about 340-odd grams mass. And you can see that every time the mass feeds, it is actually reducing, it, it causes this large disturbance in the mass reading, which tells us that it is interacting with the hopper. And you can see that the mass of the hopper slightly declines after each of these feeding events. And this is a close-up of one feeding episode, so that you can see what goes into it more clearly. So this is the kind of raw data that the system saves, and it is possible then to make all kinds of analytical use of this raw data because it is not committed to any particular kind of analytical strategy at the time that it's acquired. So for example, you can go to a very simple um, cumulative food intake. And on the other hand, if you need more detail, you can well, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Just a quick note to say that you can also do um, food preference assays as well. So here is a more detailed food intake analysis. And as you can see, each food intake event has a particular time and date associated with it, an inter-uptake interval, an uptake duration or intake duration of minutes. Um, and then you have the actual intake in grams. This is from a mouse. Now, have a look at the areas I've highlighted in yellow. Those areas are not, those, those values are below the measurement threshold of other systems out there. So it is important, I believe, to have the highest resolution of data that you can possibly get. This has been pretty much a constant throughout my research career, trying to extend the, the resolution of data to the maximum amount possible. So here, for example, we can see individual intakes of 4 milligrams, 3 milligrams, 13 milligrams, 6 milligrams, etc. So these individual intake events are actually quite numerous. And we'll come to that in a moment. But they are invisible to most systems out there. So to illustrate this, here is intake duration versus intake amount. And you can see there's a very clear relation between them. 
but the area beneath the red dashed line is just not visible to most systems. And the system that uh, we're talking about here primarily, which is the Promethean system, has been designed to set the standard for um, very, very fine mass resolution. And the micro intake events that occur below that line actually account for roughly 30% of all ingestive behavior. And the proportion of those events is actually, interestingly, higher in the photophase than the scotophase. And each of these does not really um, indicate a very large, significant food intake, but they do indicate the initiation and then the early termination of ingestive behavior. So they're particularly interesting, I feel. Okay, so let's move on to food access control. Um, there's a door which, is, um, which simply closes to prevent access to the food when ordered to do so. If the mouse or rat is in the way, it will automatically sense the, uh, the additional resistance and politely withdraw for 10 seconds or so and then try again until it succeeds. So you can do all kinds of customizable assays. You can set the system um, as with any system that you know, is reasonably versatile. You can set it to allow access at certain times of day, times and durations, times and amount consumed. Um, you can have uh, paired feeding. Um, you can have yoked feeding. All of the usual things. And if anyone actually comes up with an unusual assay, which we don't actually at the moment support, I would love to hear about that because uh, we can certainly add additional capabilities to the system. Let's go on to water intake. Uh, this is exactly the same gravimetric principle as with food intake. Um, water intake does require really high resolution because most water intake events are really quite small. And this is the reason why gravimetric determination of water intake is uh, not always an option that is used. So here is raw drinking data. Uh, you can see the individual um, water intake events. And those can be accumulated if, if you wish, or you can actually do detailed water intake analysis or water plus food intake analysis as well. What about body mass? Well, body mass is a very, very important parameter. And actually, so is enrichment in the cage. Um, certainly, animal care and use committees are very keen on enrichment. And so we've combined body mass measurement and enrichment by adding an enrichment habitat to the cage attached to a mass monitoring unit. And every time the animal enters or leaves the habitat, it gets weighed to 2 milligrams. And again, all of the raw data are maintained. So this is what the raw data look like. And it looks pretty messy, but let's have a look, zoom in on a section of that. And you can see more clearly here what is happening. So it's starting over here, we see that the animal is not in the uh, habitat. Here it enters the habitat. The habitat increases in mass by the mass of the animal. And then the animal grooms. You can see that from the disrupted mass reading there at the end, leaves the habitat, and so on. So here, for example, as well, it enters the habitat, grooms, is stable and quiet, grooms again, and leaves. So we can tell precisely when the animal is in the habitat and pretty much what it's doing in the habitat as well. <clears throat> And this gives us very fine resolution of body mass measurement. Most mice, for example, will enter the habitat very frequently, um, roughly on average about every 15 minutes. And so we can get completely non-intrusive, no stress, no cortisol induction um, measurements of body mass. Voluntary exercise, well, in addition to, of course, the animal just wandering around the cage, um, both the mouse and rat habitats should certainly, um, for maximum experimental versatility, have some kind of running wheel. Um, these wheels, for example, the mouse wheel is fully contained within the cage. And again, all of the information from the wheel is actually uh, binned on a second-by-second -second basis. So looking at the raw data, this is second-by-second -second wheel rotations and you can see that it, it, the wheel will rotate anywhere from 0, 1, 2, or 3 times per second, depending on the speed at which the animal moves. 
and then we can very straightforwardly convert that to cumulative distance, and then by differentiating the distance, we can do running speed as well. Total activity, um, with the animal's position is monitored every second using X, Y, and Z arrays. The actual arrays are strobed and measured um, a couple of hundred times a second, and then the results reported back on a second-by-second -second basis. So the beam spacing here is, I believe, unusually fine. It's one centimeter. So the beams have a spacing of one centimeter, and then the um, the beam break array has built-in intelligence that allows it to calculate the um, optical center of mass of the animal to within uh, 2.5 millimeters. Uh, rearing is captured as usual with these systems by um, a z-axis. And again, the nice thing here is that everything is recorded is simultaneously and in full synchrony with all of the other sensors so that you know second by second precisely where the animal is and what it is doing. Uh, you can also separate fine and coarse motion, in other words, uh, you know, directed locomotion around the cage from small activities such as grooming and scratching. And then you can do various kinds of activity analysis. You can look at the amount of time the mouse has spent in certain areas, um, where it has been in the cage, you can compare activity profiles between different mice or different rats, looking at the effect of different treatments, etc. Let's move on to measurement of metabolic rate. So this is pretty much what the system looks like. It's very different in appearance from anything else out there. It's very different in design as well. Um, it uses indirect calorimetry measurement of oxygen and CO2. Very unusually, um, it also measures water vapor. Now, the water vapor measurement allows us to actually completely remove the dilution effect of water vapor from the oxygen and CO2 measurements, which otherwise uh, would require actual chemical or thermal scrubbing of the water vapor from the airstream. The other unusual thing about the system is it operates entirely in pool mode with negative pressure. And what that means in terms of the cage, here is our cage again. Um, the air, you notice this manifold running along the base of the cage. That manifold is perforated by hundreds of laser cut, very tiny holes, which allow air to be pulled from the manifold and out. We use a very high flow rate. And so the air inside the cage is essentially very, very close to ambient conditions. It is not pressurized. There are no pump vibrations and pressure pulses in the cage. And the cage does not have to be sealed. So, in fact, although a cage may start out sealed, if the sealing is a requirement, as it is with push systems, cages will never actually stay sealed. There will always be leaks and data uncertainty associated with leaks. That is completely avoided using a native pull mode operation. So when it comes to actually measuring the, uh, the gas signals, we have a couple of ways that we can go. One of them is to do what's called multiplexed calorimetry. Multiplex simply means switched. And so we measure the metabolic rate of multiple animals in sequence. And what this means is that we're sharing an analyzer between animals. In the typical system, you can share an analyzer between, let's say, 16 or 8 animals. Typically, we um, would recommend 8 animals. And so sharing the analyzer means that it is a fairly economical prospect. And then the question is, how rapidly can you sample the animals? Well, using mathematical techniques and a variety of uh, proprietary approaches plus the very high flow rates that we use, we're able to reduce the time taken to get a really stable measurement from the cage to less than 15 seconds. And that gives us a cycle time, which means from animal 1 back through or out through 8 or 16 or 24 animals back to animal 1 of between 2 and 5 minutes, depending on how you set the system up. So it's very rapid, and in fact, that's for those of you who know the technicalities of respirometry, that's less than half of the time constant of the cages. 
And so this allows you to differentiate very nicely between uh, mean energy expenditure, resting energy expenditure, and active energy expenditure, which the slower systems will not allow you to do. Um, if you need very rapid response, then there's basically no alternative to using what's called continuous calorimetry, and that is measuring the met metabolic rate of multiple animals simultaneously. So that's with one analyzer chain per chair per animal. So this um, is a relatively um, pricey option, but if you need the very, very finest resolution, um, it is pretty much the only option that is going to give you really the second-by-second second information that you would need for certain studies. And because we're basically oversampling relative to the time constant of the cage, there are mathematical techniques that allow the removal of washout effects from the cage volume versus flow rate. And so this allows you to look at even the most fleeting and subtle metabolic signals. So we have quite a number of these systems out there and people are very happy with them indeed. So here, looking at data analysis, let's have a look at the actual practical appearance of data synchronization. Here up at the top, we have rates of oxygen uh, consumption, CO2 production. You can see they're certainly quite variable. And you notice these high peaks over here? Well, those high peaks correspond over here to activity. The orange is pedestrian activity moving around the cage, and the blue is running on the running wheel. And you can see here you have beautiful correlation between individual activity episodes and the metabolic information. You can also see here on the um, RQ or RER trace, the animals, when they are quiet, are moved to pretty much uh, more, mostly fat metabolism with some mixed component, and then as they become more active, they switch their metabolic substrate primarily over to carbohydrate. And you can follow that, as you can see here, really, really nicely in great detail. Moving on to food intake. Food intake here is in orange, and water intake is in blue. And you can see here when you have individual episodes of food and water intake, and these are correlated very heavily with the activity periods as well. Here is body mass following along. And this last trace over here is really interesting. As you can see, it's very similar to the energy expenditure or the gas exchange trace. But this is actually water vapor output from the animal. So we are measuring, as I mentioned, water vapor. And this gives you the total amount of water lost by the animal. Now, you might think that because you're measuring water intake as well, that the water output would be trivially equal to the water intake. But actually, that's not so, because in metabolism, you are also producing metabolic water. And so the amount of water that the water vapor signal gives you is the total ingested water plus the, the hydrated content of the food plus the metabolic water produced by the animal. And so this gives you uniquely a method to measure the metabolic production of water by the animal, which can be pretty, ex pretty extensive. So for example, um, one gram of lipid will correspond to the production of roughly one mil of, uh, of metabolic water. So that can be a pretty large part of an animal's overall water budget. So really what we're looking at here is very high data resolution. So back in the old days before the correct instruments were around, the heavens were a considerable source of puzzlement and mystery. Uh, when the correct instrumentation started to arrive, we began to see things in much more detail and discover that things out there were even more interesting than what our imagination had suggested. Let's move on to behavioral analysis. And let's tie together different forms of behavior here in this graph. And it's a relatively complex graph, but it'll make sense, I promise. So let's start over here at the far left. The black trace here is the body mass habitat. So we can see the animal is in the habitat, it grooms, and then it leaves the habitat. Right after it grew, leaves the habitat, 
you can see this blue trace here is water, water mass, and we have a, the animal drinks. The gold trace here is running on the running wheel, binned every second, and so it leaves the habitat, it drinks, and it goes onto the running wheel, goes back into the habitat. Now it eats, that's the red trace. And you can see it eats quite a lot of food. You can see the reduction in mass in the hopper. And it has a very large drink of water, goes back into the habitat, is still for a short while, grooms like crazy, goes out, has a little small drink, and goes back onto the running wheel. Touches the food container, goes back on the run and drinks again, goes back on the running wheel, etc. Point being here that with the system, you because we have synchronized high-speed data acquisition in all of the sensors and all of the cages simultaneously, we essentially have an absolutely detailed picture of everything that mouse has done. All right. Um, not shown here, of course, is the moment-by-moment -moment position data that we also have, so we know precisely where it is in the cage at every moment as well. So given that we have this information, well, what do we do with it? What we can do is automatically extract behaviors based on the sensor interactions. So this shows you a list of behaviors that can be automatically um, detected, eating food, touching the food container without eating, drinking water, touching the water container, um, running on the running wheel, entering the habitat, just momentarily touching the habitat, and then various long and short lounge behaviors. And if you have a second food hopper in the cage, it will also detect inf information from that. So this gives you a way of getting a lot of behavioral information from the animal in the cage without requiring video analysis. Now, you can certainly combine this with video analysis, too. We have uh, you know, good understandings with the, um, the leading video analysis people, such as Naldis. Um, but for many applications, you might not even need video analysis. So each of the automatically determined behaviors has a date and time at which it started and ended, duration, the mean position in the cage during the behavior, the distance moved, the amount of time it spent rearing, and then each behavior has a unique quantification. For example, with um, eating food, it's the mass of food eaten. With wheel running, it's the meters run on the wheel. Um, with the entry into the habitat, it's the body mass, things of that kind. The nice thing also is that you can also tell the system to give you information on other parameters that may interest you, such as energy expenditure, respiratory quotient, body temperature, heart rate, if you're using telemetry. And you can determine precisely what those parameters were during each behavior. So this, this shows you a simple behavior list. Uh, for example, here we have um, you know, the animal is in its habitat was in this habitat for 22 seconds, weighed 21.896 grams, went out, got on the wheel, uh, 56 revolutions on the wheel, drank water, went back on the wheel, drank water again, uh, got back on the wheel, um, and entered this habitat again, this time for a long period, and then got out and ate food. So this gives you a complete list of every behavior that the animal exhibited. And this allows you to do things like automatically generate time budgets. So, for example, this is a time budget of each behavior. And you can see here that it spent a lot of its time in its habitat um, and a fair amount of time uh, eating as well. Uh, here's a locomotion budget. This is determined using the, uh, the XY free field array. And this is the number of meters that the animal traveled during each of these behaviors. And then this is, of course, without the wheel. And if we do include the wheel in that total, it's a very different picture. And here is the locomotion budget including the wheel. And as you can see, it's a very, you know, this particular animal ran about 3.2 kilometers overnight which for a C57 Black 6, which this was, is actually pretty lazy because they can frequently get up to five or six kilometers in a night. Uh, you can also then generate, if you wish to, a transition probability matrix. And this gives you the probability of the next behavior an animal is going to show 
So for example, after eating food, it's very likely that the animal, quite likely that the animal will drink water afterwards, this particular animal. It may go on the wheel, but it's not very likely to go on the wheel. Uh, much of the time it'll go for a short lounge, it will basically run around the cage without interacting with anything except the XY sensors. So let's look at drinking water. Um, drinking water, it may afterwards go ahead and eat. Um, it's very unlikely to go on the wheel right after drinking water, which is interesting. It's very quite unlikely to go onto the wheel after eating food, but it will not go on the wheel after drinking water. After drinking water, the most likely behavior is a short lounge, and then after the short lounge, the most likely behavior is to go on the wheel. So really, you're getting a picture of how this mouse's little mind is working, how the behaviors tend to chain in probabilistic ways. Now, you can also, as I mentioned, extract behavior-specific data. So for example, here, we have the ambient temperature at each of these behaviors. This is basically the light is a darkness index. So here, the uh, light, light was quite high. And here, if we went into darkness. And here is the energy expenditure in kcals per hour. And you can see that it starts off low and then rapidly gets very high. And that's as you are leaving the photophase and entering the scotophase. And likewise, with the respiratory quotient, you can see that you're moving from predominantly fat-based metabolism rapidly as the scotophase is entered, and you begin to um, show much higher breakdown of carbohydrate as your metabolic fuel. So let's look at a couple of things that uh, you can get from interactions of these sensors. One of them is a very important metabolic parameter, resting energy expenditure. Um, so let's have a look at the resting energy expenditure in the place where it is most low, mass is most likely to rest, which is in the habitat. And you see here that we have a couple of different point populations. The short duration visits to the habitat tend to be very variable in metabolic rate. And the longer durations are quite a lot less variable and much lower, forming this little point cloud here off to the side. So what is the basis of that? Well, the nice thing is that we can pull out the actual original data with second by second resolution. And look at what happens here. The blue trace is when the animal is going into the habitat. The red trace is the energy expenditure of the animal. And look what happens you can see that as the animal enters the habitat, its metabolic rate declines precipitously, goes to a low and fairly stable state of around about 0.3 kcals per hour, and then there's a rapid, rapid increase in metabolic rate prior to the animal leaving the habitat. But because with this animal is in the habitat, we can see that there is no activity that correlates with that rapid increase in metabolic rate. So that rapid increase has to be something other than muscular and is almost certainly activation of brown adipose tissue, although I don't have hard information on that just yet. In other words, we can see that entering the habitat, the animal is intending basically to sleep. It has a cool down period that lasts about 15 minutes, then a long period of low energy expenditure. And then energy expenditure rises prior to activity. And then the animal grooms, as you can see from the disruption of the body mass trace here, and then leaves the habitat. So you may be wondering how to apply some of this in your own research. It's actually a pretty interesting phenomenon. Presumably, we're looking over there at the, the, the proximate cause being um, an ACTH and cortisol spike. But it's a very consistent phenomenon. So if we look again at those four episodes where the animal has entered the habitat for a long period of time, this is the one that we've just seen. Here is the next one, and you can see the same pattern. The next one again, same pattern. Next one again, same pattern again. So it's very consistent, and um, this is something that um, is part of a collaboration I have with some people at, uh, at UW, and this could, be a, this could actually make a very interesting publication in its own right.
So again, this is the kind of thing that you can get if you have sufficient resolution of data and sufficient synchronization of data. So talking about resolution and um, synchronization, let's look at activity. Now, let's look in particular at the running wheel. So the, you have different durations over here of running. And you can see that by the time the animals are running for about a minute or so or longer, you have a fairly good point cloud there with a good deal of variation, however, within that point cloud. So this variation is actually predominantly caused by the animal running at different speeds. It costs more energy to run at a faster speed. But how much energy does it cost to run at a higher speed? Well, this is actually a very interesting topic, and it's one which I was very interested in during uh, my academic career, and that's measuring locomotion energetics. So, for example, the way that you would normally do this is you run an experimental animal on a treadmill at a fixed speed, and then you measure at the same time its metabolic rate. And so, for example, you can do that with a horse, you can do it with an ant, you can do it with a mouse, but it's very difficult, and the mice actually have to be forced to run. Otherwise, um, they have to be forced basically using electrical grids. And so instead of using a treadmill, we simply use the running wheel, and we can get these beautiful relations between energy expenditure and running speed. So here we have meters per second versus energy expenditure in watts or joules per second per kilogram. The slope of this line is in joules per kilogram per meter, also known as the minimum cost of transport. And this tells you a great deal about a mouse's or rat's muscle function, coordination, cardiovascular conditioning, and what have you, totally free of the stress bias that you get if you try and run it on a treadmill. And it's highly consistent. This is eight different mice running entirely voluntarily across one night. Very, very, very consistent data with very high R squares relative to the kind of R squares that you get from manually trying to control the speed of the animal using a treadmill. Now, the data are also consistent with literature values, so the M cost or minimum cost of transport is right where you'd expect it to be for an animal of mass size. Food intake, well, here we have, um, I'm going to be looking in a bit more detail at the short uh, intake durations. So here we have a graph of intake duration versus intake amount. Now, as you can see, um, at short durations, you have very small intake amounts. Well, this would seem to be pretty obvious, but if you look at it in more detail, put out the, bring out the magnifying glass and actually use the resolution that you have available to you, to you, you can now look at the intake duration here in seconds, versus the energy expenditure at the moment that that intake was taking place. And you can see that the very short intake durations tend to correspond with very high energy expenditure, which is very interesting because these micro intakes occur more in the photophase. The animals do occasionally run on the wheels in the photophase. And these micro intake events usually occur after high um, brief energy expenditure episodes and potentially it could indicate that there is a feed-forward mechanism involved whereby the animal is priming its digestive system with a tiny amount of food prior to coming back and revisiting the food hopper and eating more. So again, it's very important to have the ability in any system to be able to detect these events. And it's made possible by having well, basically one part in 500,000 resolution. All of these events, by the way, are statistically verified with a student's t-test of the hopper mass prior to the feeding event and after the feeding event, and only device, only intake events that meet probability guidelines are recorded. What about environmental influences? Well, and mice are exquisitely sensitive to their environment, as are rats. They're affected by sound level. They're affected by the light level, of course. They're affected by occupancy when students and uh, you know, researchers and technicians come into their habitat. They're greatly affected by temperature. They're affected by relative humidity. And they may also be affected by barometric pressure because many small animals actually are able to pick up changes in barometric pressure as well. So we've developed 
um, environmental sensors which are able to address these things. So just very briefly to show here, this is light level. This is um, just taken in my office with the light on. Here I'm moving around the office. This is an occupancy detection system which uh, detects the presence of any human in the vicinity. Here, turn the lights off, close the door, and then reopen the door. And then a very, very dim light from an exit sign down the corridor comes into my office, this being at night. And you can see that the system is capable of det detecting extremely low light levels as well. The blue is sound level. And so if a mouse were present, um, it would certainly be picking up on the occupancy. It would be picking up on the change in light level. Um, it would then be entering essentially its um, the SCOTA phase. And then it would certainly pick up these changes in sound level as well. And what is causing those changes in sound level? Well, here we're looking now at temperature along here and relative humidity along here. And you can see that these individual sound episodes are actually the sound of the air conditioner cycling and bringing the temperature back down. Air conditioner on, temperature back down, reaching the set point, and then back on again. So you can determine precisely what kinds of environmental influences may be affecting your experimental animals. The result is cleaner data with fewer outliers. So the ideal with any kind of system is to have the maximum amount of information recorded that is possible. Now, I'm searching for a metaphor for this. And something I came up with was the light field camera by a company called Lytro. And Lytro, essentially, let's say that the Lytro camera is looking at this field. And let's now move over to this as an analogy of um, a data-rich system. So you've gone ahead and you've finished your investigation. Um, the animals are, um, have all been returned to the pool. The metabolic phenotyping center, or whatever it is, is now occupied with other things. You're writing your paper. And you discover that someone has just published a new method of data analysis that you would very much like to use for your data had you had a legacy system where you had to set up the analytical parameters ahead of time, you would not have had the flexibility to change the, the analytical parameters that you have. Now you've submitted the paper, the referee reports come in, two of the referees love it, one referee says it's great, but I am absolutely insisting that as a condition of publication, the food intake records have to include the amount of force, for example, exerted by the animal on the food hopper. With a normal system, at the very best, you might have be able to go back to the metabolic phenotyping center and rig things up to be able to measure the additional thing. With a system like Prometheon, you can simply go ahead back to the original raw data, change the focus, and get the information from the raw data with no need to rerun the experiments and purchase new animals and book more time. So really, everything I've been talking about in terms of mass and um, food intake, energy expenditure, and everything else and behavior has been about trying to improve the resolution of data acquisition in metabolic phenotyping and intake analysis. And that is essentially what the system is all about. Now, obviously, if you're looking at high resolution, you're looking at a lot of data coming in. So it's a natural thing to worry about a total data information overload. Fortunately, the system analyzes data using scripts, which can be user written or we can write them. Uh, we supply systems with a very large collection of different kinds of scripts. Everything is traceable. Everything is apparent. There are no black boxes. Nothing is hidden. And it's simply a question then of running the script, pressing, pressing the play button, and you get the exact information that you require. So for many of these things, I've taken um, <clears throat> advantage of the fact that I've had a fair amount of research experience, especially in metabolic measurement and making very, very precise measurements. Um, so as a recovering academic, I've gone ahead and used that in the design of this instrumentation. Um, now, I hope to see some of you, hopefully, at uh, EB in Boston. I'll be at booth 1015 if you want to talk. I look forward to meeting with you there.
And now I think the question, the question and answer session can begin. Uh, you talked about many components, um, and we've had some questions where there's a theme of modularity. So I think the best way to put it is, can a researcher start with a subset of sensors and then somewhat build and progress into multiple units and multiple different measurement capabilities? Um, yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, the system is very specifically designed to be very easily expandable. Uh, all of the sensors are intelligent and daisy-chained, and so each sensor knows what it does. It has its calibrations built in, and you can simply daisy-chain additional sensors as needed. So, for example, you could start off with just food intake measurement, then add water intake measurement. You could add body mass down the road. You could add uh, X, Y, R, A, and then eventually, if your research direction requires it, you can add metabolic measurement and so on. Uh, the number of cages. Um, systems typically would start at about four cages, depending on the particular system, um, and can go all the way on up to as high as you wish. Okay, excellent. Um, the second question uh, actually goes back to uh, the start of your presentation when you were talking about food intake, um, uh, multiple hoppers, uh, and then also we had a question specifically about the potential of, of mice removing like uh, feed pellets and then subs subsequently chewing on them in the cage environment. Now you had mentioned that you have the ability to take micro events and I'm assuming this kind of plays into the technology that allows you to make those very fine measurements. What features exist in the system uh, that make those micro events possible and actually maybe combat against that scenario that was asked about there, the you know removing of food from the hoppers? Well the micro intake events are separate from caching. Okay. So, for example, the micro-intake events are when the animal actually interacts with the hopper, uh, removes a very tiny amount of food, and then leaves the hopper. Mm -hmm. um, caching is very, very, very difficult indeed to prevent. Um, one of the only ways in which it's possible to diminish caching is to use powdered food. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's always going to be an issue. So, in an attempt to address this, we have designed hoppers with different grill sizes so if people feel that they uh, the animals have um, unduly easy access to the food and are beginning to steal large fragments of pellets they could go ahead and exchange the grill for something with a smaller spacing which makes it much more difficult to take anything substantial out and would require the mouse to essentially nibble at the food but in all honesty um, there is not going to be anything out there that is going to completely eliminate caching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mice can be very determined that way. Okay. Um, just out of curiosity, are there other measurements that the system could be, could make in which you know a researcher could correlate other data to make at least a confident uh, judgment about what's happening in that instance? Yeah. Let's say, for example, hypothetically, if an animal were to an animal is in a cage with a fairly, uh, with a food hopper with a fairly wide grill spacing. Then it's possible, for example, that the animal might be able to steal roughly maybe 100 milligrams or so of a food pellet. Now you'd immediately be able to t detect that caching event because you would see that the hopper mass would reduce suddenly by a much larger amount than would be the case during a conventional nibbling but so you can certainly distinguish the events in which the mouse has taken a substantial fragment of food from ones in which it's actually just been nibbling at the food mm -hmm. but then the other interesting thing that you can do because the animal goes into the food the into the um, body mass habitat frequently is if the animal has gone into the habitat uh, gone out found a piece of cached food and eaten that cached food and then goes back into the habitat its mass will increase by the amount that it's eaten. And so if the animal has not visited the food hopper or the water dispenser, but its mass has suddenly and mysteriously increased, then that may mean a caching consumption event. So all of these various modalities of information can interplay to give you a much more complete picture of what the animal is up to. Perfect. That's a great response. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, Actually, well, two things. We've got some questions about water consumption. So, um, you know, I guess the, the, the main point on these questions, uh, just to paraphrase them, is what concerns uh, should someone have about evaporation? 
uh, and, and in general, any water loss um, as it relates to how the Promethean system is measuring. Uh, can you comment on that? Yes, absolutely. Well, evaporation naturally would be a problem if you were doing um, a fairly simple measurement of, say, the mass of the water hopper versus time. Now, we are measuring the mass of the water hopper versus time, but we are able to detect, of course, because the animal is interacting with the water dispenser, we're able to detect the moment it touches the water dispenser, we're able to follow it during the drinking episode, and then measure the mass of the um, water dispenser immediately after the mouse has left. Same goes for rats, of course. Mm -hmm. And so we have a stable mass prior to the beginning of the drinking session and a stable mass right after. And during that time, evaporation will be completely negligible. And so all of the um, measurements that the system makes in terms of mass are intrinsically differential. We're not, in other words, looking at the overall reduction in mass of the food hopper in order to calculate food intake, because we're separating that out into individual food intake events, which are differential in nature. Mm -hmm. And that means then that as the um, water vapor content of the air inside the cage changes, the amount of um, hydration bound to the food will also change, and thus the mass of the food itself will also change as well. And we pick that up. Mm -hmm. That change, um, as with the change in mass that you get from evaporation, that change is negligible over, say, a feeding episode or, in the case of water, over a drinking episode. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Um, and actually, yeah, I'm going to move basically onto another feature, uh, and that is the, what you discussed about pull mode respirometry and the way that the system is designed. We've had someone also ask about, you know, uh, if they were to have a concern about uh, the type of air that was basically entering the cage, how would one go about regulating that? Is it possible to regulate it? Um, yes, it is absolutely possible to regulate it. Um, the, the way that you would handle that is to put the animal into typically, um, you know, a, a temperature cabinet or a climate cabinet and mm -hmm. then regulate the concentrations if you wish to uh, within the cabinet. Okay, and so it, that's very easily done. For example, you can very easily um, manipulate the oxygen concentration within the cabinet. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, one one um, final question. Uh, what about um, waste output? So urine and feces. Uh, if one needed to measure um, this in their protocol. Right. So, for example. Um, in order to get fully quantitative urine um, recovery, there's essentially no alternative to using a metabolic cage. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we all know those ones where the animal is on um, a grid, basically, and the urine and feces are separated and captured uh, completely quantitatively. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we actually have a very good relationship with a um, metabolic cage manufacturer, Hatteras Instruments. And we have um, converted their cage very simply to be compatible with our system. It essentially just means a different lid on their cage. Okay. And so you can measure the metabolic rate of an animal in a metabolic cage and get fully quantitative urine and feces recovery um, to the extent that you can also even measure, you know, metabolite concentrations and what have you in the urine. Now, you can do some of this in the cage. You can certainly look at the, um, the total fecal output, for example. You can quantify fecal pellet sizes and what have you um, in the cage. It is certainly possible to use the cage without bedding, and we have a wire mesh floor which can be used in place of the bedding, and then simply putting um, blotting paper, bibulous paper, under that, you can, um, to some extent, get quantitative information on urine output as well. You can also get information on urine output to some extent by back calculating thanks to the fact that you have the overall water output of the animal. So you can look at the water intake, you can look at the hydration um, of the food, you can look at the metabolic water production. In this particular case, you need to know the food composition to calculate the metabolic water production. That gives you the total input, and so you, you, can, you can measure um, urine and feces output that way as well. 
but essentially in order to do this really properly you pretty much have to go to a metabolic cage okay but the yeah so then the blending of these two technologies you you have done this uh, so oh, it's yes. certainly capable oh yes absolutely very you can good also do activity measurements in the metabolic cage too mm-hmm that's great well, I'm going to suggest, yes, let's, um, uh, in interest of staying on time, uh, uh, we'll, we'll call that the end of our live Q&A, but as a reminder to our audience, uh, we have collected all of the questions that have come in, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, what will happen is we will obviously uh, have Dr. Lighton answer these, and there will be a transcribed report available for download in the coming days. Along with that report, we will have the recording and slides available for today's session. So. Um, uh, yes, I'd like to remind everybody that the, the final part of this, uh, this um, uh, webinar will be the invitation to complete a survey. So thank you in advance for those that take a few minutes to complete that. Um, again, that helps us plan these sessions and gives um, uh, important feedback for our presenter, Dr. Lighton, which we're all eager to hear from you. So uh, yes, please uh, fill those out if you can. And uh, we'll remind everybody that uh, the next session, session two in uh, this webinar series, will be held on Tuesday. Um, April 28th and uh, that particular day we're going to talk about 24-7 uh, automated behavior tracking um, with um, you know a focused application as it relates to the safety pharmacology and phenotyping space so um, please join us again uh, I will you know officially thank Dr. John Lighton uh, for his time today John thank you very much it's been a pleasure working with you and having you it's been a real pleasure interacting with you and I look forward to the questions Yes, and um, and uh, yeah, and thank you to our audience that's out there uh, and has joined us today. And we will look forward to having you again soon on a future Insight Scientific event. So have a wonderful day, everybody.